I appreciate the honor and the, um, that I was asked to fill in today for Pastor David. Of course, you know he loves to be here. And uh, so he's giving away a very precious place, knowing, I, I need to say this, knowing that even though I may be able to fill in for him theologically, I cannot compete with his humor. Um, I actually think that I'm kind of clever. And I kind of giggle at myself every now and then, although my children uh, assure me that that is not the case. And David assures me that that is not the case. So um, I guess in this case, I should take my cue from the, the testimony of those around me rather than from myself, which could be a sermon on its own. But uh, the humor I won't try to compete with, but theologically, I think I can talk about women better. <laughs> come on, I think, th come on. I think perhaps he may have on a certain filter called male filter that could just be a little skewed. So again, cha-ching, here we are, ready, ready to talk about women. Um, for, before I start, actually start my sermon, I wanted to show you something. Anybody know what this is? Come on, I heard one over here, anybody else? IPhone. iPhone. I have a new iPhone. And that may not matter to you, uh, it matters greatly to me because my iPhone had been, or my phone had been, it was such an old generation that they didn't even support it anymore. And I could, had no, uh, oh, I have my picture up. Isn't that what everybody does, selfies? Um, um, I had to have it on speaker because the, the, I couldn't hear it this way anymore. It was so old, everybody say, how old was it? Oh. Well, it wasn't as old as me, but nonetheless, it, it, it ranked in that realm of ancient. So I went on and I got a new iPhone, and I, I looked, they said, do you want, you know, the mini, you want the maxi? They looked at my hand, they said, you need the mini. They said, what color would you like? So I got to pick out the color, but out, I mean, you know, the, out here, there was maybe six options, not a bunch. But nonetheless, how many of you know, I wasn't looking for the outside, I was looking for something with an internal design. Right, so I went looking for a, a, a vehicle to ha to touch what was inside to be able to use it. And when I got my new internal design in my hand, it took a little training. What is this swiping stuff? I used to have an off and on button. The other day I was in D.C. Just came back from a week in D.C. I have swiped my phone 200 million times in eight days. Swipe this way, this way, looking for the button. How do you get this thing on? And that was after training, I'll have you know. Not only did they give me a little bit of training, but they gave me a manual. It used to be you got it with the phone. Now you have to go online. But so I have a source to research what this sucker does on the inside, the internal design. And then to top it all off, my phone. My phone was so old, how old, how old, it wasn't ancient as me, but it was ancient. So now they pair them, they put your phone and the new phone together, and in this magic of engage, Star Treks of the world unite, engage, the material goes from this side to that side, but they said, your phone is so old and your battery is so bad, bad it, won't, uh, it won't do that. So the, the experts had to upload and save somewhere on a cloud out there and download, hallelujah, here's your phone, only to get home to find out the contacts were lost and 2,000 pictures were lost. So now I have to go to some more experts. So the phone calls began, didn't they, Pastor D? Um, well, I'm gonna guess 15 hours worth of phone calls and going up to the experts and up to the experts and up to the experts and going to hire experts so that we, this thing could not only be what it was, but it could do what it was designed to do. And everything that it was designed to do is locked up in there unless you have someone who knows how to pull it out. Do you think maybe I am doing a setup for a sermon? Come on, hopefully you haven't missed that. In case you have, I'll bring it back up. So we must function out of original design. That's, that's, what, that's kind of what I'm going to say to you today. We must function out of original design. So I'm going to talk, look at original design, talk about that. It's, in some ways, this sermon is going to be broad enough that you men will not be lost. 
So if you're looking for me as a lady to tell you men what to do, that ain't going to happen. But now privately, I'll be glad to share that information. I want us to think about original design, though, in several aspects. So the first place we're going to do, because I was thinking that the topic of women, you know, is broad. We could talk about motherhood. We could talk about being a wife. We could talk about how uh, you have to have certain demeanor if you obey the New Testament uh, uh, aspect and what Paul admonished of a, of a woman. There's just so many things that we could talk. We could talk just practicals about what never to do. Um, that would be my own can of worms, which I did decide I would not open on the stage today. Uh, in um, the 14th of January, we will be married um, 54 years. So, yeah, I got a bucket of worms and so does he. But so I decided to take kind of like a, a broad overlook and then trust that the Holy Ghost is going to help you to determine how to make that specific to your life. So we're going to start with this idea of original design. And you find that in my favorite book of the Bible, Genesis, and actually probably just about my favorite uh, chapter of the first book is the first chapter. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter one, and it's something called the dominion mandate. And I have given you just uh, the scriptures I'm going to be using. I've put those on the board for you. So I'm just going to read Genesis 1, 26 through 29. Um, this is general design. So it's going to fit male and female. Okay. So all ears, this, this applies to you. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Now, in case you're thinking that's what guys are, he didn't say, let us make guys. He's basically saying mankind here. So let us make mankind in our image and according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Then God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, fill up the earth, subdue it, have dominion. Again, he repletes over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So just a couple of comments to make out here as we're talking about the general image, your internal programming. Okay, no matter what your outside looks like, there's this internal program, programming that is... Um, Every one of us partakes of this. One of those is that we were made, <clears throat> excuse me, in the image of God. And this concept of image means that we have the ability to reflect him. That when people see us, they can have a visible representation of what an invisible God is like. Now that's kind of like, right, yeah, right? Except remember Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, we want to ascribe that just to him because he's Jesus, but actually all of us have an ability to make visible uh, the attributes and the heart and the person of God. So all of us are image bearers, and we, we're kind of in a day, you're going to know this to be true, where uh, people uh, want to think that God isn't present, uh, the knowledge of God on the average basis is... Uh, um, not as well known as it may have been 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago in our culture. So without an awareness that you're made in the image of God, people are looking as to what image, who am I? And so we see an identity crisis happening. People thinking their identity comes from this ethnic group, this philosophy, this history, this, you know, whatever, all trying to uh, mark themselves for identity and in honesty and, and in essence, we are God's image. And when God is plugged back into that um, scenario, a uh, sense of wholeness and uh, awareness of who we are and why we're here. And we're going to talk about that. Why are we here? What are we here to do? Who am I? Questions. They actually say this is some of the most basic questions that helps every child develop who they are uh, in their, in their worldview. A, par a worldview can never be sound unless you know who you are. You are image bearer. Somebody say image bearer. Now that's pretty heavy, heavy revy for the first one that I start out with. It's only going to get worse from here. Just take a breath. So we are created in his image and then uh, to be his likeness. And the concept of these Hebrew words uh, means that 
if God were here, he would do it like this. That's what likeness means. That I, am rep I represent him. I do it like he would do it. I not only, only present who God is, but I act like God would act. So Jesus said um, uh, that all things that he did are heard and said, it's because he heard his father do it and hear it and, he, and say it. So we are image bearers and then we act like God is. We represent God on the earth. And so then the scripture goes on. You got all this stuff that was created. You got birds, you got fish, you got all these animals, creeping things, crawling things, uh, all these different kind of animals. But none of them have the distinctive of being image bearers. They bear an aspect that can teach us something about God. Like uh, Proverbs said, go to the ant, O oh sluggard. Don't you love to read that passage when you just slept in over the, that morning? <laughs> but, uh, so there are aspects in the created order that we can learn some things about God's attributes. But no other creation of God has the distinctive honor that humanity has. So here's who all of us are, male and female. We show who God is and we act like God does. And all of that, uh, this, this makes phone calls. Now there's a lot of programming that helps to do that. This connects to the internet, net, that there's a lot of programming. So I wanna say you're a, uh, you are an image bearer and you are likeness, even though there's going to be, we're going to find lots of other programs that make that possible. Hear what I'm saying? So uh, this is uh, who you are. And then he says, this is for all male and female to do this. And then he says to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill up the earth. Now remember that the way everything was created in Genesis was created fully grown. Like you had a cow that didn't come as a calf. It came as a cow. And, and the apple tree came as an apple tree with apples in it. And the dinos dinosaurs, what? Yeah. Uh, uh, the aardvarks, David mentioned those last week, I believe. Everything came fully grown with the seed in it for the next generation. God created a fully grown Adam. He didn't create a baby. But the seed in, was in Adam, was in Eve for the next generation. So that's that idea, procreate, make more of what you are. And that commission is going to be on everything that God created. Uh, so part of that procreation is have more babies. So God began with Adam and Eve, and but then there, look at all of you. Where'd y'all come from? Oh, so all right. So that's what that's part of what this commission was that there would be procreation. There was also recreation. In other words, Adam and Eve take this earth and use the work of your hands and the knowledge that you have and discover what can be here. I'm going to be on an airplane. I just came home from one airplane. A couple of days from now, I'm going to be on another airplane. Do you know everything, everything, everything that it takes to make an airplane was in the ground when God spoke that to Adam and Eve? But as time went by, man discovered what the earth, the creation, was able to be and able to do. So he made more of it. Everything that makes this phone was here in the original. But God, man discovered, oh, look what I can do with that wiring what was in here <laughs> stuff all the stuff that's in here man discovered what he could do with it so part of this creation male and female is go to work with your world and make it bigger and find out who you are and what you can do well who of us have have done something and then said to ourselves i didn't even know i could do that right did you ever do something on your phone? I didn't even know that would do that. Sometimes I've done things I didn't even, doggone, I'm all that and so much more. Look what I did. So we find out what the earth is when we go to work with it and release its potential. It actually helps us to release the potential in us. That ain't a male thing. Men, men don't go to work and women stay home because women aren't smart enough to go to work. That would have been, you know, way back when. That, that's an every person thing. Whatever your task is, whatever stuff you're given to work with, whether it's in the home or outside of the home, whether it's in the marketplace or whatever you're given to work with, go to work with it because you've got the mind of God. You've got, you got uh, things programmed in you that makes you able to take the world and multiply it. That's all in this original creation, God is going, I made you so you can do this, now go do it. 
That's humanity. Fill up the earth with what you can do. Uh, uh, and this is the design, if you can hear it, of all human beings, male and female. But then there's some design that is specifically female. So if you'll give me a chance, I'm just gonna look at another passage here and it's going on the board for you. Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Lots of here we won't talk about, but let's just get the whole context. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Now at this point in our, in our narrative, Adam is here. God created Adam. But he said, I'll make a helper comparable and, uh, to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, <clears throat> that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper compa comparable or compatible to him. So he's looking you know, at these animals as they come, male and female, the pairs of them, and realizing, well, that's not like me, and that's not, not, not like me, and I sure don't look like that, and that doesn't walk like I walk, and doesn't talk like I talk. And so he's, he's realizing that uh, these come in male-female pairs, but there was none that would mirror him. So uh, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then uh, the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to man. And Adam said, now this, now this, listen, Adam goes, yep, looks like, sounds like, acts like, feels like, right? Now this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Um, so there was kind of another Adam in a little bit different form, in a female form. And she is, it said here, I will make a helper comparable to him. Um, if you are, had been around any length of time when King James was used most often, most frequently. This phrase says, I will make a help meet for him. Anybody ever word, heard the word help meet? Some of you. That was, that's the common term. Sometimes people would translate that to a help mate, M-A-T-E, but that is not what the scripture was saying. It will, I will make a helper meet or suitable or adaptable, I love this translation, comparable to him. So let's look at what that female design is in these terms of help meet. So now again, we're still looking at original design, but we're looking at the woman's role. Because I just need to, I either need to give Greek or Hebrew every time I stand up. It's kind of like an internal motivation. I have no reason to tell you how that was ever, it ever came about, but it prompts me. It, when I lay my head on at night, it speaks in my ear, where's your Greek? Where's your Hebrew? So just for my own sake, not that you even care, but I've got the pulpit so you will listen. <laughs> this is what that Hebrew is saying. He said, I'm going to give a help. The word help, or, uh, it was translated uh, in our passages there, helper, is the word azer. I'm going to give you an azer. Somebody say azer. Maybe look at somebody standing by, sitting by you that's a female and call you azer you. That's a compliment. You can call somebody an azer and you're complimenting them. The meaning of this word means to strengthen or support. So we think about help as like, well, I got to help them do that. That's my lot in life, just to help them do their thing. I mean, that can be presented as though it's some type of a negative. And I, I think I'm wanting to just to not announce today the value of all human beings, no matter what our role would be. So an azer means to strengthen, or it means to support, and it's used 21 times in the uh, Old Testament there, in, that, in the, this Hebrew word. It's used two times of women, but look at this, it's used three times for military strength. When there is the need to, uh, to be able to advance a cause where extra strength needs to be applied, that's an azer. 
when you need to advance a cause because extra strength and cunning and needs to be applied, that's an azer. It's used 16 times for God. How many think that would be all right, right? As God helps us, how many of you think there's times where we're at a place where if God would bring his grace, if God would bring his aid, if God would bring his support, it would be what it would take to get us over and onto and victorious. That's this idea. God said, I'm going to design something for you, mankind, that will be so perfectly suited to you that whenever you need that extra, whenever you need that support, whenever you need uh, the victory, whenever you can accomplish accomplish it by yourself, I'm going to design somebody who can walk along with you and help you to attain. Hello, woman. Yeah. Man, now I wish I could sing. I'm like David. Somebody else sing it for me. I need, I need, a, uh, uh, I need to sing the song of the female. Um, uh, the other word, help meet, the word meet is the word comparable that you read a minute ago, but that's the word neged. So you are an azer neged. Everybody say neged. neged. And that means to be worthy or appropriate. So I'm going to bring you that support and that strength that is appropriately suited to help you as your counterpart. It actually, literally, I love this, it literally means to be in front of, it means to be opposite as to the man, it means corresponding as to the man. So think, think in terms of, I got a right hand, and I can do a lot with my right hand, but I got a corresponding hand, you know, that is different and yet the similar and the same. And the two hands, God designed it so that so much can be done because the two hands work in unity. Not one better, not one lesser, but one corresponding to the other that that aid to accomplish, so much is done in unity that cannot be done in singularity. So whether we're talking about uh, the family unit, husband and wife, or whether we're talking about any time where more than one comes together, you have exponential power, wisdom, and strength because you have a cooperation. God was saying he was going to bring to Adam that extra help. I actually even thought, um, think about how the DNA molecule is formed, and it's this two-sided deoxyribonucleic acid. And I just said that because there's never a time in life where you get to use that word if you know it. I actually looked for, where can I put that in the sermon? And I found it, so here it is. So that double helix as this ladder of your DNA goes uh, 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 to be put inside your cell, and that comes from male and female. You couldn't even be who you are if those two hands hadn't joined together. So the overarching biblical narrative, what they call the meta-narrative of male and female, is culminated, and Paul brings us this by the time you get to the book of Ephesians. He said, this is a mystery, but let me try to explain it to you. He said, the, the, uh, there is Christ and his church, and that's kind of like Christ is the husband, and the church is the bride, and they... You are bride of Christ. You're the female counterpart. Shut up, right? That God designed to, be God, uh, to help Christ in his dominion effort. That, that is an honorable role. The, the, we are defined men as female. <laughs> I must not boast at this point and lose my humility. But, you, but this is the big picture of the role of the female, of the role of the woman. So we have, um, we have ge general design that we found there in Genesis 1. We have specific design to the female, all females that we found in Genesis 2. And then we have original design that is particular to you to me, to you, to each of us. And that original design is found in uh, the book of Psalms, verse, uh, Psalm 139, 13 through 17. I, in all wisdom, took a Benadryl before I came to church. 
That's why the water bottle is open and I'm sucking water. Um, I'm going to do just a, just a little bit of opening this passage to us because part of this still moving thing that we're on is the process of releasing that which is locked up in each one of us, helping us. We are a new creation in Christ, and we want to image and likeness that new creation. And so the, these, these ideas of looking at what is latent in there, what is that potential? How is that viewed? Then how do we help each other get that out? That's why men pray for men, women pray for women. We're going to talk about the kids. We're going to talk about all this different stuff because there's things that God put inside of you and his desire is that who he is in you is expressed at all times, not only to the embitterment of the world around you, but to the healing and the wholeness of your very own being so that we don't keep making the problems we have to live in because we're walking out of a different pattern. I keep not making this work until I find the pattern. I promise you this stuff is stubborn. It will only function according to the pattern. Would to God that we could be so wired that we could not do wrong things, but we, we have something wired in us called volition that God put in us. So we can choose to let the wiring out. One, one good wiring or work contrary to our wiring, which is destructive. Get out of your a spiritual mindset and just hear what I said. If you work contrary to the design of a thing, you destroy it. If you work contrary to the design of this, you work destruction into your world. We work destruction into our relationships. So let's look at this as personal design. We're going to talk about it at this point. He says, for you, uh, this is the psalmist talking to God, for you formed my inward parts. The word formed has within it the context of the creator of a thing. How many of you think that the creator is the owner? So that's in there too. You're the owner, this psalmist is saying. Like God created the earth and formed it and he owns it, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So every baby in the womb, every one of you is owned by God. You, you are God's possession. Children are the heritage of the Lord. Well, parents may get to help form them, but they belong to God. All right, so you belong to God. And he said, you formed me in my inward parts. This idea is the inner organs. It's sometimes translated kidneys. He formed, in, he formed our insides. It also includes the idea of the soul. So the inside of us was formed by God who owns us. And then he says, you covered me in my mother's womb. So in case you're wondering what we're talking about, we're talking about a baby that's designed in the womb. That's the context here. He said, you covered me. You shut me up like a hedge to protect and defend. And in, in, in one verb tense, it means even in this closed place, you weaved me together. Where did that happen? In my mother's womb. Female role. We'll come back and talk about that wombing in just a few minutes, but just hold that there. He said, the psalmist says, I'm going to, i got to praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully means that, oh, such a deep sense of reverence. Nobody else like God. So I, I, my, I, I, you're, I, I reverence you and I'm wonderfully made. This word means uh, a distinct or distinguishable. I reverence you because I'm not like anybody else. I'm distinguishable from every other creation. Each of us perfectly made, wonderfully made, crafted in a secret place in our mother's womb as he makes you distinct from everybody else. If you're going to pull out of what you are to be out here, you have to know who you are. And God made you with particular detail, particular detail, particular wisdom, particular sense of, oh, look at this holy thing I'm making. That would have been God's perspective. The psalmist says, oh my gosh, I got to offer reverence because this is a reverential thing that he did when he created me. Got my preacher on. I'm going to come back to the teacher. Okay. <laughs> He says, marvelous are your works. 
marvelous, surpassingly, surpassingly wonderful. Nothing can equal what you have done when you did your works. And the works really means his labor. When he, he labored, he worked you. He worked you. He, he crafted you. You're his enterprise with the work of his hands that occurred to make you individually different than anyone else. And he says, and that my soul knows very well. May I encourage you to help to discover yourself so that you, like the psalmist, can say, I, I know this. I know me. I've discovered what you've done in me. For you will function out of your design. Everybody functions out of their design. Wow, Jesus, you're so good. You'd think you'd be too busy <laughs> running the worlds and all to put the pieces together of a baby. But the scripture makes it clear that he was invested in your creation. He said, my frame, my bones were not hidden from you when I was made in that hiding place. That's a reference to the wound. So he said, you know, my inside and even my bones, my um, strength of my frame was created when I was in my mother's womb in that secret place. And he said, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. So the lowest parts of the earth is just a metaphor for the womb. But look what he says here, skillfully wrought. This would be the same term that would be used if we were talking about a woman who would take her and do needlepoint or crochet, choosing the colored threads that would go into this tapestry. That's the image here. Basically, the summit said, you chose all the color, colored variations of the threads that would design who I am, and what makes me, me, me and you ne took your needlework and you put together the tapestry of my personhood. Hello, look at somebody near you and say, wow, what an amazing work you are. He says, your eyes saw my substance yet being unformed. This, is, this word, yet being unformed, is this idea of embryonic. Before, before the coding, the DNA coding was fleshed out, you saw my substance, literally something rolled up and yet hidden, just kind of an unformed ma mass. The psalmist said, you saw me then. And in the book, they were all written. In your book, the word book here is this idea of a decree or a scroll. It isn't like, well, God looked down and said, okay, so this is who you are, so I better write. Let's see, what's your eyes blue? Right down there, blue eyes. What's your eyes, you know, what's your height? Short. Right down short. No, God ha opened up the scroll first and said, now then, we're going to follow that scroll as I knit together in this secret place the purpose, the multicolored abilities and fashion together, the intricate, intricate details of this person whose name is such and such. You were known by God before you were known. You were found by God and loved by God and created by God before you were fashioned in your mother's womb. I'm telling you, internal design takes on a whole new meaning, does it not? He even says, uh, the days were fashioned for me. Uh, this, this word, the days were fashioned, means the framework. Not only did you read from this scroll, but the framework of the days in which I would live. Because listen, you're designed to do something in the now. You're not designed to live in the 1820s, or you'd have been living in the 1820s, because he set your time frame now. It doesn't matter what's going on around about you, as though it's going to affect who you are, you are here to affect what's going on around about you. And specifically designed to walk in this day and to talk in this day and to release that potential locked up in your wiring into this day. And the Bible says the earth is going, come on, sons of God. Do in the earth, be image, be likeness. Now, I know I'm kind of preaching to the big crowd here, but each one of us, whether we're male or female, we have this mandate 
that comes from eternity, that's wired into our very being, that carries with us the impetus and the strength and the ability to change the world round about us and to alter the course in which we are living. Not only to change the person next to me, not only to change the, uh, the child that grows up in my home or the student who sits in my classroom, although that's all part of it, but collectively bride, we're here in the earth at this time. You can tell I've just come from eight days, about I can't, 700 hours in prayer. I don't know. We had, we, had 24 hour, we had 24 prayer meetings that lasted no less than three hours of prayer meeting. So whoa, whoa, whoa. I kind of went off into my own little excitement there. All right. So he says, the days were fashioned for me. And when as yet there were none of those days... You, you planned them for me. Then he goes, how precious, valuable, prized are your thoughts for me. The word thoughts are not, oh, if I think about you, I think you're okay. It's not that. It's your purposes. He says, how precious are your purposes for me. Oh, God, how great is the sum of them. The word sum is rosh. Some of you will know that word from the Hebrew calendar, the Rosh Hashanah, which would be like our New Year's Day. Rosh means the head. So Rosh Hashanah, head of the year. That's the word used here. He said, your thoughts, the sum of your thoughts mean they're the first thing that God puts his thoughts and his plans out first and then all of this follows. Like all the rest of the year follows New Year's Day. All the purposes and plans for each of us as an individual follows behind uh, these thoughts that God has for us that are written in the book. Your eternal scroll, your eternal destiny. Uh, Aaron, you said so many times today, I wish, I almost wished... I could appreciate that everybody sang your songs after the worship service after I heard you sing them. But you kept say, talking about heaven into my earth. You kept talking about being who God had created us to be. We are image bearers. All right, so let me just take you to this last kind of thought then. So we know all people are image and likeness. We know that females have a special design in that. And then we looked at each one of us has our own special design. So I want to just take this last few uh, um, moments here and talk about the coding and the original intent in a woman's role. So we're going to talk about that now. Um, all females will carry unique individual coding, yet we all are going to have this, gener this general coding if you're a female. Um, first word, <laughs> this is not a real word. <laughs> I just thought if I could say deoxyribonucleic acid, I probably ought to tell you that I know woomer is not a real word. So I just thought I'd tell you that. But I put it to the, there because... When God brought female, he, he made her a wombed man. That's what a woman is, is a wombed man. And so what this womb does in the natural, it provides a place where the coding can be applied. So we just read that. God has your design. He has coding for you. But how did that get on your body in a womb? The female doesn't create the baby. The f female houses the baby while the eternal coding, come on, puts on flesh. Isn't that right? So a woomer, <laughs> a woomer provides an environment where coding can be applied. So let me just say this to you. We looked at a woman in the context of a baby maker, uh, you know, procreation. So motherhood. We looked at woman, the first Genesis 1 was woman as in the, in the case of a, a wife. But I want to talk to every woman, whether you're a wife or a mother, if you're a woman, then the coding that makes you able to be the wife or able to be the mother is in you, whether you've been a wife or a mother. Can I, do I need to say that again? So the coding that makes you able to be a mother is that coding is in everyone whether you've been a mother or not. The coding that makes you able to be a wife is in you whether you've been a wife or not. So if you are a woman, you are coded to be a woman. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? So what does that mean? That means you have...
have the ability to assist other people to become what they are encoded to become. You have the ability to stand by people and listen to people and dig into them. I, I guess I will tell something personal here. As a wife, and as Dennis and I are raising the children, I had the insight to know who they were that he seemed to sometimes miss as he's tasking and taking the whole family into an assignment, right? And so I would sit down and say, but if we do it that way because of who she is, if we do it this way because of his internal design, that won't work. And so women, we have that ability and God has given us and granted us and graced us and wired us to be able to help people become who God has made them to be. Now listen, God created you with all this internal design. You came out and people started messing with your design. Quite often moms and dads were part of that and friends and teachers. So that original design can get twisted, it can get tainted, it can get corrupted. We call that carnality. What an amazing, wonderful word. To release the eternal design, sometimes we've got to deal with this temporal t shifting that has occurred. We have to deal with this carnality. And so moms, spiritual mothers, spiritual women, God has given us the ability to take people into our hearts and into our prayers. Now men, you should do this too, but we have a special grace for it to be able to say to them, we're gonna pull you out of your carnality and pull you into your eternal purposes. I think sometimes we're like a t we're like the tug of war that stands in the middle. We say we got one hand on you in your carnal man. We got another one hand on you in your spiritual man and we're not letting go until we bring you out of and into eternal design. I think I think and again I I've been around a while, seen a lot of things. Seen, we, as we pastored for how many years? 35 here, about that. So got to see things that worked and didn't work. Got to practice out our philosophies on you all. Sorry about that. Just like you practice out your philosophies on your kids. Anyway, I think what works is everybody needs a mom. You need to identify someone who's been there, done that, got a bunch of t-shirts and can help you speak wisdom to you, speak perspective to you, and help you see who you are, not who your carnal training has created you to be. Moms, if you hear somebody say, well, that's just who I am, you're going to have to accept me the way I am. Honey, that's a chance to get a hold of somebody and say, we got to help you out of that carnality and into that destiny moment. So I think everybody needs a mom, spiritually speaking. I think everybody needs a big sister. I think a big sister is one who says, I'm not way far ahead of you, but enough ahead that I can help you in this next step. Yeah, see, see what I'm saying? Who has been there, done that? Oh, maybe only has one t-shirt, but it's the one you need. Everybody needs, and then everybody needs siblings, you know, that are just your peer group. But peer groups cannot help you the way moms and big sisters can help you. To do what? To release. I, give me, come on, uh, thank you for the man in the store that taught me how to swipe. When all my stuff was left, I lost, I needed an expert. Sometimes you need an expert to release the potential locked up in you. Females, come on. You're nurturers. You're trainers by nature. You're wombers. When we give you a chance at the end of the service and in this next week, begin to think of yourself. Who, who can I touch? I think each of us should have one hand on somebody under us and one hand on somebody over us. And I'll tell you the one I want to make sure if I take their hand, I want to make sure if they've taken my hand, their other hand is on Jesus. Because I don't need to be bound to a person. I need to have a helper to connect me to Christ. You understand what I'm saying? So you are a woomer and you are an azer. Remember we said that's who you are. You are an azer. That means you are a strength giver. 
that you can add that which is needed to bring completion. I could tell you story after story where my own children or people in our church came and just said, I have a threshold I have to cross. I'm just weary. I just can't get there by myself. I just need a little help. And I, I could come along and be a prayer partner. I could be a listener. I, could, I, I would take the time. You have to take the time because, listen, we sang an amazing song, Thy Kingdom Come Quickly. It never comes quickly. We may want to sing it as in wishful thinking, but the kingdom comes one step at a time. Transformation comes one step at a time. Sanctification comes one step at a time. One problem at a time is solved with heaven's perspective. And if you can't do it by yourself, get a mom. Get somebody who can be the left hand to your right hand that can help you to dissect and discover those eternal destinies. I love this passage. I'm going to close out with this. It's found in 2 Corinthians 1, uh, 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. How many of you think God is male and female? I mean, he is neither gender. So talk about a comforter. Talk about an azer. So Father is. And then it goes on to say, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may... Having been comforted, listen to this, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You look behind, I had to take that step. and God helped me, can I help you? And this is this idea of an azer who is the helper. Females, you are like men in that you are... Um, a, an image bearer and that you are to represent God. You're like men in that and that you are able to go to work and make your worlds fruitful. You're like men in that. Females, you're different because you're wound and special giftings to be able to womb and to help. Females, you're like every other male and female in that you are specifically designed. I want to say to you, the internal intent is how we get heaven to earth. And you know where heaven comes to earth first? In here. The first place heaven comes to earth is in here. Then you help God make heaven in earth out there. We'd like to stand and pray, heaven come to earth out there, and I'll just stand back and watch because that would sure be the easy way. But that isn't the way heaven comes to earth. God creates heavenly stamped image bearers walking in their design and their intentional and eternal intent, filled inside, knowing who, knowing, knowing what all they can do. Hello. Knowing what all they can do. That's programmed in us. And then knowing how to get it out. Knowing how to release it out. Knowing how to see it manifested in the earth. Females, you are a very special, special creation. You without, without us, man would not be able, would not be capable. Without us, things would not be done. We are uniquely, amen. We are uniquely and wonderfully made as, an, as individuals, but also as uh, the helper so that men and women together can join hands to see the kingdom advance in the earth. Take the opportunity to be helped and to help as an amazing, mighty female that God has created you to be. Hey, thank you for watching this message from Navigation Church. We hope it strengthened and encouraged you today. But let's not stop with the message. I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you never miss out on a single message. I also want to invite you to join us in person or online every Sunday morning at 905 or 1045 at our council campus or even our online campus at navchurch.org or our Facebook Live by following our Facebook page. And make sure to check out navchurch.org to discover more about Navigation Church and ready for this and even plan your next visit with us. Thank you for watching. I look forward to meeting you soon. God bless.